And then for me, I'm like, I, I don't, I'm always just prone towards, I, I want to believe in what I can understand fully. And I think that that's a true thing about the Holy Spirit is we don't understand it fully, but at the same time, God does give us a lot of descriptors as to who the person of the Holy Spirit is and how his gifts play out in our world. Well, welcome back to the Calvary Assembly of God podcast. I am your host, Jonathan Sigman, and I am joined here by Pastor Bob, our lead pastor and our discipleship pastor and uh, lead makeup coordinator, Stephen Nichols. Um, well, some people's makeup is harder to put that's on. That's right. You missed a couple spots here for me, but uh, we are going to be talking today about the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think it's important to just note right off the bat that the Holy Spirit is not just a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. And um, today we're not going to get into all the complexities that exist within the Trinity, because that's a whole <laughs> separate conversation that we should probably get to at some point too. But we are going to have a dialogue around uh, spiritual gifts and what exists now. Why do some believers think they the supernatural gifts still exist? exist? Why do they think they don't? Uh, why does it seem like there's so many weird expressions. Um, like, what what is it? Like, what, how do we make sense of all of this? And what are the healthy and unhealthy ways to think about spiritual gifts? And so uh, we're excited that you are tuning in. And so where I would like to begin with both of you and uh, makeup guy, Stephen, <laughs> I hope you're fine with me just referring to you as that now. Well, as long as I get paid more. For Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I do. I want to hear... Uh, give give me your upbringing on spiritual gifts. Give me your background. Then, Pastor Bob, I want to hear yours. So my upbringing on spiritual gifts uh, was almost non-existent. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a just a tradition of faith that was very like hesitant to spiritual gifts and um, was very skeptical skeptical about people who did participate in them. So. Honestly, when I, and just very transparently, when I started coming to Calvary years and years ago, almost over a decade ago, oh, which is nice. wild. Actually, more than a decade ago. Love it. was it. wild. Um, I, it was just like very like, what is this about? What is this spiritual gifts things? I had a lot of questions. I was very skeptical. And uh, so it took a lot of just very, uh, a lot of growing, learning, asking questions about what this is. So I approach this conversation from that lens, just kind of as my default. Uh, so I'm hopeful that is, that I, and I'm assuming that's many people's uh, assumption of it as well. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of Christians, and when you say spiritual gifts, you're specifically talking about the supernatural oh, ones, yeah, yeah. and that that grew up, and I, I'm the same way, that I grew up that uh, those gifts uh, were for a period of time um, in the early church, but they they ceased at some point um, and in different arguments, different ways of exactly where that happened, but that did exist in the early church, but it stopped at some point and right. is no longer accessible. I, I grew up with the same way, and mine was actually antagonistic, and I would even say judgmental of, yeah, of Christians yeah. who actually believed that. It was kind of like, like, you're the Looney Tune, you're the crazy people, and, like, we kind of have what is, like, real Christianity and, like, thinking Christianity, right. and I, I think you grew up in a similar yeah. way. Yeah, and to be fair, not everybody was that way, but right. there was a huge just uh, push towards that direction that you were like, they're, they're like less mature Christians because they believe these crazy things. Yeah. Um, so not everybody was like that, but that was, I, I think both of us were probably on the very other extreme of, of this entire conversation, dialogue about spiritual gifts. There was a vibe of that, for yeah. sure. Now, how about you, Pastor Bob? Is that how you grew up? <laughs> no. Uh, actually, I, I tended to hang around environments where any effort to regulate a spiritual gift was considered quenching the Spirit. And there's actually a Bible verse that says not to do that. And it was amazing what some people could get away with by just saying the Spirit told them to do something. Mm. And so... Uh, so we would see some rather out-of-bounds behavior, and uh, people were, by and large, uh, uninformed about how do you address that. And so while your experience might have been uh, a fear of that, my experience was probably the things that would have terrified you about mm -hmm. that. Like, you, you would have felt very justified. Yet when you look at Scripture, it doesn't seem to 
take that approach. It's not uh, anything goes or nothing should happen. There seems to be this other thing that Scripture calls for. And I think that, that regardless of your denominational stripe, the more we look at this uh, from a biblical lens, uh, the more balanced our view tends to get. Hmm. Well, let's do that then. T- tell tell me about what are the spiritual gifts as described in Scripture. Like like like, talk to me about what those are for people who are maybe less familiar with this conversation. Give me the biblical background of what exists in Scriptures. So one of the things I thought was pretty cool is uh, the the term spiritual gifts. It's first found in First Corinthians twelve. It's one of the locations, or a couple. It's one of the locations where it talks about it. But that's where we get this term spiritual gifts from, uh, and it's really interesting because uh, the the term in Greek is translated very strange. In fact, most scholars would believe that the the word gifts is uh, they people translators kind of threw that word in there to make it make sense a little bit better. Uh, gifts shows up a little bit later in that passage, but more very literally what it translates out to is like Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware of spiritual things or the spirituals or the spiritual persons, and it just translates very weird into English. They threw gifts in there, um, and it seems what Paul is saying, he says that there are spiritual things, the way in which the Holy Spirit manifests itself um, there are multiple different ways. He doesn't want people to be unaware about it, and then he will give those things as a gift to us. And it feels like splitting hairs, but here's why I think this is, it was very helpful for me, is that we often think of spiritual gifts like everybody just, like Christians just all have a superpower, that when you accept Jesus, like you inherit like invisibility or like really fast running or something like that, and you just get this superpower. Uh, but it's not how Paul talks about it, that he talks about it in a way Uh, that it is the way in which the Holy Spirit will manifest in people, and then he gives them as a gift to to people at the time he chooses when he wants to be able to utilize it and when people are available for it. And uh, this is a very different frame of thinking for me, Mm -hmm. that it's not like, well, I have this spiritual gift, and you have this spiritual gift, and these are my superpowers, and these are yours. It's not really how, I, I don't think how Paul and the apostles thought about this. It's the way that it would manifest in the Spirit, and then and then God would give these things out when uh, the appropriate times were in place. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pastor, tell, tell me more about um, the different passages in Scripture that exist uh, regarding spiritual gifts. Yeah, so when I think about spiritual gifts, I think uh, some people lock into the 1 Corinthians 12 passage, and there are nine specific gifts that are listed there. Um, I, I really loved your uh, your reference to the word, uh, which means spirituals. I, I don't want you to be... Uh, the root word of that is actually grace. So it's helpful for us to think about spiritual gifts as the way God extends his grace through our lives, yeah. not just to our lives, but through our lives to others. So it feels to me like uh, there's not an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. In 1 uh, Corinthians 12, we have gifts of the Spirit listed there. But in Romans 12, uh, we have gifts that are given by the Father. And uh, these are things like leadership and mercy and uh, helps. And and my view is, is that these gifts are given whether or not you ever become a follower of Jesus or not. This is just God's investment into the, the humanity, that each person will have something they can offer the community that betters everybody. Even if you never bow a knee, you never become a believer, like that's his gift to us. And there are clearly people who are good at fixing things and good at leading things and good at, at creativity. And so these are, are gifts that seem to be born in us and they never go away. Uh, Ephesians 4 talks about spiritual gifts that the Son gives, Jesus the Son. And these are our ministry callings, and they're apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And this seems to be gifts that Jesus gives in order to guide uh, and direct his church, but even more importantly, to invest in other people so that they can be developed in his church. And so I think that these gifts, when, when Jesus gives this to someone— That tends to be true the rest of their life. So I have a a, a pastoral gift. Um, There'll come a time when I can't be the pastor of a church any longer. I will have aged out of that responsibility. It'll be better for the church and (laughs) and for me that I not do that. And so, but what's also true is that no matter where I am, whether I have the title or not, or receive a paycheck for that or not, I still have this sense of calling. 
And so wherever I am, I kind of operate out of that calling, even though I'm not trying to be anyone's pastor in that moment. And then 1 Corinthians 12 has these spiritual gifts, and these seem to be different. Gifts from the Father are invested before you're born and last a lifetime. Gifts from the Son are invested by Jesus uh, as you enter into his kingdom. And gifts of the Spirit seem to be these temporary enablements. You don't own them, so like a gift of healing. That doesn't mean you can heal anybody you want wherever you go. But it really more is, it's more like, uh, so you, you have an illness or a disease and it's, it's affecting your life, and the Holy Spirit may choose to use me to pray for you and give you the gift of healing. Now, I don't have the gift of healing in that scenario. I just allowed a resource to flow through me, and now you're the one who receives the gift of healing. And so that seems to be a very temporary thing. These are uh, available to us as needed through promptings of God's Spirit, and most often they occur simply by uh, uh, a word of encouragement or a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. I like that. I've never heard that change of perspective, that it's actually the recipient uh, yeah. who is receiving yeah. that gift. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And that totally flips it on his head, too, because sometimes the gifts can become like it's this perception of the person who has the gifts. It's like, oh, well, they're more spiritual or right. they're better. And it is actually just God flowing through you. But the recipient is a whole new model for that. I love that. Uh, so, Pastor Bob, I, I want to I ask you this. Why have so many Christians believed uh, believe now that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased to, to exist, and why do you believe that they still exist mm. for believers, and are they only available to specific believers? Um, and I can, I can come back and, and ask, because it's three questions in one. So why don't, why don't we start with, um, why, why is it that Christians do not believe that, that this exists anymore? I think uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one is they've seen uh, something that was claimed to be a gift of the Spirit, and yet it seemed to be demeaning or out of bounds, judgmental, maybe even broke uh, some of the concepts of the fruit of the Spirit and the commands of Christ. And so they just go, well, that's not the Spirit, mm -hmm. and, and they're frustrated by that. And it's just easier to throw the baby out with the bathwater in that situation. So they just kind of say, yeah, none of that is... They won't, how they usually say, it's not needed now. We have scripture. Mm -hmm. We have a community of faith. Uh, we have teachers. So we don't need that now. That was for them. I think that people who do embrace this have realized that there's not a shortage of need. So when Jesus came, he didn't just um, teach people kingdom concepts. He healed people of their diseases. He freed them of their bondages. He satisfied their hunger. So why would the church take on a mode of ministry where the only thing we do is we teach the commands of Jesus, but we ignore the rest of the ministry of Jesus as though that's not needed now? And when you look at the early church, these were not absent. When Paul went out and ministered, Peter went out and ministered, all the apostles, and, and you see this throughout history, there was the presence of the Holy Spirit activating other people to allow resources to flow through them to bene uh, benefit others. So for me, humanity hasn't changed. We're not fixed, and it's not just a teaching assignment. So what other resources of grace would be available to us that would help us with the needs we actually have? Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because it almost, in operating that mindset, it's almost uh, subconsciously making the decision that I can fulfill the mission of Jesus simply by information alone yeah. without the working and the empowerment of the Spirit in our world, which I don't think anyone actually says or believes that, but it is you are kind of operating under that assumption when, uh, when you discredit one over the other. Yeah, I guess it depends how far you take it. Like, I think you're taking it out to its furthest point, which would be like, basically, I can do this without the Holy Spirit. Oh, and I, yeah. I don't think that that's the place that Christians land who who believe that the, the gifts has ceased. Um, can you guys describe to me what is the what is the scriptural foundation for why people believe that the gifts no longer exist? Like, can, can you, do you do you know of those? Are you aware of those? Yeah, I, I mean, there is a passage, uh, Paul addresses it. He, he has three chapters in 1 Corinthians where he specifically dives into spiritual gifts. 
And the first has to do with the identification of those spiritual gifts. And, uh, and he winds up with the uh, regulation of those spiritual gifts because he understands things can get out of hand. And so he wants that to be done. His, his line is, everything should be done decently and in order. Mm-hmm. But uh, there is a passage where he talks about tongues will cease and, and uh, knowledge will pass away, mm-hmm. but love lasts forever. Mm-hmm. And so there are some people who have said when he said that, that's when it happened mm-hmm. or it happened shortly after that. But Paul really doesn't make that claim. Uh, he's just saying the most important thing, the, the motivational principle, the, the operating system by which a Christian uh, lives their life is motivated by love. Mm-hmm. When you get that right. In fact, one of the things I love about Paul is he says, he's finishing one chapter on spiritual gifts. He says, yeah, I show you a more excellent way. And then he goes into chapter 13, love is. Mm-hmm. And what is he saying? He's saying the most excellent way is not a desire to do good things. It's not a desire for God to prove himself to other people. The most powerful motivational factor for believers to be open to the release of the gifts of the Spirit in their lives is simply to love others well. Mm. Yeah, and I think when we see spiritual gifts utilized for self-serving purposes and not through loving other people and just trying to be a conduit of God's grace and love to somebody else, that's where things get twisted. And I think whenever you see, I I think of this, whenever you see any spiritual gift, whether it's the supernatural kind or not, uh, being used in a horrible way, it's no good. Like uh, Hitler, you could say, was you know, use, had a leadership gift. (laughs) Well, yeah, he used it for the worst possible way um, that you could possibly use that. But so that, but that doesn't mean that leadership is bad. That, that means that he used that in a horrific way to do horrible, horrible things. So um, that's where I think it's like, we, we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater and say like, okay, since we've seen spiritual gifts used in bizarre or unhealthy ways, we just then get away from them. And I know that that can, that can be my own tendency. It's like, cause it's like, I've, I've, I've seen, you know, these people on TV and they're just throwing bodies down and, and this sort of thing. I'm like, it's like a ah, mosh pit. It, yeah. Right. It, it, it looks like that. And I'm like, I don't, that doesn't look right. And I, again, I'm not judging. I don't know anything about this stuff, but at the same time, it, it throws up my defense walls. And then for me, I'm like, I, I don't, I'm always just prone towards I, I want to believe in what I can understand fully. And I think that that's a true thing about the Holy Spirit is we don't understand it fully, but at the same time, God does give us a lot of descriptors as to who the person of the Holy Spirit is and how his gifts play out in our world. Yeah, I, I think you just tapped into something there that's very important, especially for Western Christianity. If we can only sign on to that which we understand fully, Mm -hmm. the bandwidth of our spirituality is going to be quite remarkably narrow and shallow. Mm -hmm. That that faith actually requires us to embrace things we don't understand. That doesn't mean that they're unregulated in any way. But if we only embrace what we understand, we're in trouble. Well, we also, I think we forget this too, is we can... We, we just assume that we cannot be fooled. Like, if I can act in te- uh, intellectually understand something, that I can never be deceived. Oof. And um, and I don't know where we've ever got this thought. <laughs> and even people, like, to, to your point, like, just because people have utilized leadership in a bad way doesn't mean leadership is bad. I've seen many people, we've all seen people who have used Scripture in a really negative way and twisted mm-hmm. it in ways that it was never meant to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... Just because we can intellectually understand something, it doesn't mean that we're less capable of being deceived by something or misusing something. Uh, so I think we have to be fair and honest when we are in this, that that people can misuse things, and they can misuse any good thing uh, for, for evil, and mm-hmm. the enemy can hijack things for his own purposes. Um, so we have to be fair and honest, I yep. think, when we're, when we're thinking about this, uh, and only looking for the healthy examples and... and taking out the unhealthy examples. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because even a good gift from God can get mm-hmm. turned into evil, and uh, we have a tendency to do this as humanity. But I even think, too, and 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 Paul, I think it's Paul, correct me if I'm wrong here, but w- that we are to worship in spirit and in truth, that both of those things have to be tied together, That uh, and I don't know if this is the intention of the passage, but almost as if there's these things we don't understand, the spiritual powers that we have we don't have control of, but then also this intellectual 
honesty mm -hmm. that has to come with it, that we, that we have to pair both those things together. And if we ever remove one from each other, that's when it leads to really, really bad things that the people get hurt and you believe false things and you have misunderstandings of what's actually happening. Is that why you think sometimes the spiritual gifts get so weird, <laughs> like uh, from whether it's an insider or outsider perspective, like there are times where it's like, huh, that looks weird um, and maybe not biblical or maybe biblical and maybe I'm just closed minded. Like, how do you guys process the the, the weirdness factor? Well, Jonathan, you are weird. So oh, nothing's going to change that. It's just the spirit working in me. <laughs> it's just you. It's just you. <laughs> So I think a couple things on it. I, the first eye-opening thing that uh, when I started this journey is that the spiritual gifts don't have to be weird in order to be legitimate, mm -hmm. and they don't have to be big and blowing trumpets and sounding the alarms when it happens, that, that it can look very um, small and gentle, like a, a whisper from the Spirit. Like, that was very eye-opening for me. The other thing I would say I would push back, and you guys can—this you guys can. Uh, uh, this was a growth point for me, so you guys can push back on this if you need to, but the Holy Spirit— does not work in ways that we expect or understand sometimes. Like even in the Bible, he, God would do things that looked very weird. Um, so I, I think it is fair to assume that sometimes the Holy Spirit can do things that we are not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, so that shouldn't be the goal, like let's do things as outrageous as possible, uh, but I should be open to, my, uh, to understanding that the Holy Spirit may do something that's not within my comfort zone, and if it's always within my comfort zone, then... It, it, there's a good chance that I am not fully opening and allowing the spirit to move with, within me. Um, so like, I don't know, like talking through a donkey and stuff like that. That's weird stuff. It is. I don't know. Fire coming down from heaven. It, like it's weird stuff sometimes. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't have a resolution to that, but I'm just yeah. processing that out loud. I do like what you said though, that the, the pursuit is not right. weird, yeah. <laughs> but that we have to be open to a whole variety. Now, uh, Pastor Bob, I'm interested in your take on this. It seems like you read the, through the book of Acts and so much of Scripture, and it's like, man, Holy Spirit here, there, and everywhere. And nowadays, uh, especially in our country, it feels like Man, it, it feels like rare <laughs> where we see at least this overtly over-the-top supernatural thing. Um, what's your take on that? Is that just us as Christians like missing it and not seeing it? Is the spirit like not active in the same kinds of ways? Like, how do you process that in today's world? Yeah, that's a good question. One of the things that fascinates me about Jesus after his resurrection is how often he wasn't recognized immediately. And so there's a kind of, of almost expectation if it was Jesus, he'd be the glow in the dark, radiating, louder voice, taller Jesus now. And he wasn't those things. <clears throat> a prophecy about Jesus given long before he, he came to our world was that his ministry would be such that he wouldn't he wouldn't break a bent reed, and he wouldn't snuff out a smoking flax. There's a kind of gentleness about it. And so I think that where we, we run into challenges is when we see spiritual gifts that are operating with a lack of maturity. A person has an enthusiasm, but they just lack uh, a maturity. And when, when, that, when it's coupled with maturity, it often goes unnoticed because the goal is not to call attention to the person or to the situation, it's just allowing God's kingdom to flow as it naturally does through his community of faith to, for the betterment of others. I think that it's also true that there are some people who have been called to uh, more sign gift ministry uh, callings, and so they're going to fill stadiums. You're going to see things there that you don't see every day. When we read through the book of Acts, it feels to us like that was about 10 days and look at all the stuff that's happening, and it's decades. Yeah, it's decades. So they're they're pulling out important things that occurred. They're not saying this stuff happened every single day. They're saying when this stuff happened, it gives us useful information to understand how the spirit works, where the spirit works, and what the spirit is doing. It's almost like their highlight reel, and we we assume yeah, yeah, that yeah. there was their everyday life. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what, what cautions would you give to somebody who's trying to grow in their use of supernatural spiritual gifts? Like, like 
what would you say to somebody to be thinking about if they're trying to be more open to that, trying to exercise that in their life? What, 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 what advice do you have? Yeah, well, um, so in my life, I've been a slow learner to embrace these kinds of things. And my natural tendency is I don't like calling attention to myself. So my approach is basically this. If I feel uh, in any way directed, and, and this would be kind of a mental impression, uh, uh, a prompting, some kind of action step that, that comes to my mind that I think would be helpful. The first thing I will ask myself is, can I just pray this without going to anybody? Hmm. Like, can I, just, can I just ask God to do something for Jonathan or Stephen or whoever it is? And sometimes that's all God wants. Mm -hmm. He wants to be invited into a situation. Sometimes he does want someone to take a step. So then the question is, what looks mature and what comes across as kind and gentle? Because the fruit of the Spirit is also from the Spirit mm -hmm. who gives the gifts. And there's not the Spirit that gives the gifts and the Spirit that gives the fruit, and then they're at war with each other. When people do things in obnoxious ways, uh, they are, they're tarnishing the gifts. They're, Paul talks about this. If I, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels and I don't have love, it's just an obnoxious noise. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes it anymore. So he says, so don't do that. So where's the, how can I approach this with love, with gentleness, with kindness, with respect, and not to bring attention to myself? Mm -hmm. And if I can do that, I, the door will be wide open for the release of spiritual gifts in which God gets a lot of credit, but nobody else has to. It, scripture actually tells that the, the sole purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. Yes, right. And again, if if when we operate in gifts or promptings in a way that is bringing us more glory, more attention, uh, whatever it may be, then again, we have to really reconsider uh, what we're doing or why we're doing it or what it even is. Um, so yeah, I love just the subtle nature of like when I operate in a gift and I operate in the grace that the Holy Spirit gives me in that moment, that it really should glorify God over anything else, which means that, again, I love your little qualifying question of uh, how, how can I do this in a way that doesn't draw attention, uh, that is mature, uh, that does give God, you know, most of the credit and all of the glory and all of this. And again, that just, it just is a really good filter when I'm thinking through, like, is this calling more attention to me, to the individual, or is God getting a ton of credit and glory in this? Mm. And if I could run my filter through that, that it, it, make, it grounds me a little bit, it makes me feel better a little bit, and I don't know if this is the right attitude to go about it, but it makes me feel more comfortable in being open to the things of the Holy Spirit, because I know that it doesn't have to be a production, and it doesn't have to be something outrageous. Uh, that it could be a, a very gentle whisper that that nobody even notices except for you and God. Right. Well, I think part of the reason that you feel comfortable with with that as the framework is because you're operating in humility, not yes. out of like me trying to build my yes. platform in a world that every, where everybody's trying always, to do that. I always consider myself as a very humble guy. So thank you. For <laughs> you you, you do call yourself the most humble person you've ever met. Me and Moses, right? Yes, right underneath. That's right. That. <laughs> that's right. So, you know, to, to change the topic and follow up with the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the number of times in the Gospels where you see Jesus, he saw that people were starting to be attracted to someone he wanted to serve, and so he actually accelerates the ministry he's going to do for this person before anybody else comes around. And the number of times he says, by the way, don't say anything right. about this to anybody. This is humility. Right. And it, Jesus should at least be our example of, of how spiritual gifts can operate. He wasn't trying to get the largest audience possible. He was actually trying to serve the person in front of him. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how the kingdom of God can expand when that's our goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we kind of talked about some of the boundaries uh, here, but what if somebody just wants to grow in using or experiencing the spiritual gifts, uh, the supernatural spiritual gifts? How, how, what advice would you have? What what framework would you give for somebody who really wants to grow in any of the supernatural spiritual gifts? So this sounds very simple, so I apologize for not being super profound, um, but one of the things that was really helpful for me as I have and continue to grow through this is just simply asking for it in prayer hmm. and just straight up asking God, hey, Lord, will you help me see these things? Will you help me uh, do these things in, in, in a power that is greater beyond myself? 
uh, and um, just simply asking in prayer, Lord, will you give me insight in this situation? What do you What do you want to say to this person, to this group of people? Uh, will you bring healing to these people? Will you help me uh, understand things that I don't can't understand on my own? And it just looks like very simple prayers. And that's been very helpful because it does two things. Number one, it opens my heart. Um, and number two is I really do feel like when when we are inviting God in, not that he needs our permission per se, uh, but when we are inviting him in and we are opening our heart to be receptive to his work, then something different happens inside of me. And I've heard, especially growing up, people will be like, well, be careful when you pray those kinds of prayers. Legitimately, people will say, because you never know, like, demonic spirits could, like, attach themselves to you. I don't know if this was, like, common. Legitimately, they're like, yeah, demonic spirits could attach themselves to those prayers, and you could start doing something out of a demonic power. I'm like, oh, geez, I don't want that. Sounds bad. Um, But uh, there's a verse where Jesus gives a lot of comfort. He says, if you ask your heavenly Father for bread, or if a child asks their father for bread, he's not going to give them a stone. Mm -hmm. Yes, for water, he's not going to give them a snake. Mm -hmm. That if I'm sincerely asking our Heavenly Father for a gift that is good, Mm -hmm. he's not going to like, oop, gotcha, and now you're operating out of a demonic power now. Uh, That doesn't mean I can't be wise and discerning of the voices that are coming into my life, but I trust that God will reveal to me the things he wants to reveal if I'm open and asking for his things and not, not my own things. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's how I've thought through a lot of this. Yeah. Yeah, I I do think that where you see an, a discomfort with the work of the Holy Spirit, you do see um, frequently an overemphasis on the work of the demonic. And uh, I, th- I think it's fascinating where uh, I don't think the Spirit can do anything, but I'm pretty sure demons are involved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's just, a, that, that they've crossed a bridge there that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think that when you are, uh, uh, when you want to be open to what God wants to do in and through your life, it starts with a simple invitation. And here's what we need to know about God. God, for me to be understood, I have to speak words to you. And I have to draft my language and craft it in a way so that it makes sense. I just can't pick random words. I have to create sentence structures that, that make sense. And the goal is so that after I have spoken to you, your thoughts will be focused on whatever that topic or point was. God doesn't need that option. He can direct our thoughts without an audible voice. He's not limited to having to talk out loud to get us to focus our thoughts. And so the Holy Spirit can give us an impression. He can give us an idea. He can give us an insight. He can give us an understanding. And and those focused things in our mind can become opportunities to serve someone else. Mm -hmm. And so if you are open to that, you will be surprised how often something like that can occur. But our great challenge is, well, how do I know that's not just me Mm -hmm. thinking that up? And the answer is, if it's not calling attention to yourself, and if it's inviting Jesus and and the Holy Spirit into a situation, then how can this be a bad thing? Mm. So there have been times when I wasn't sure whether it was me or God, but I run it through the the, uh, litmus test, and, well, this is not going to harm anybody. It's encouraging. So... And I'm pretty sure that God is not up in heaven going, no, 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 he said something I didn't say. I think that he'd much rather that I be looking for an opportunity than that I'd be the kind of person who says, only when you prove it beyond any reasonable doubt, then I will speak a word Mm. or take an action. I think we're all uh, operating under this assumption, but it's worth uh, saying this as well. But again, filtering it through the filter of Scripture as well, that if it's contrary to what's happening in Scripture— um, or against what Scripture says, then of course it cannot be the Holy Spirit, that, mm-hmm. that he cannot right. contradict himself in that way. So I think that we we operate under that assumption, but I, again, I think it's worth just overtly saying that as well, because that, that scares people sometimes too. Absolutely. And I think uh, the, the thing I'd want to end on for any of our listeners here is to know that the Holy Spirit is an encourager, and the Holy Spirit is a 
a prompter and the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you and wants to have relationship with you, the triune God, that that is the desire of God. And that's part of innate in who we are. And Jesus even said, it's better that I should leave and leave you the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we wish it was like, I just wish I had Jesus standing right here so I knew what to do. Um, and I've, I've felt that, but I think Jesus answered that question for us when he said, it's, it's actually better that I go and leave you the Spirit, because now we, as followers of Jesus, as followers of a triune God, are empowered by the Holy Spirit in anything and everything that we do. We have access to the Spirit and to God, and so I just want to encourage you to be humble in your use of the gifts, to pursue the Spirit and the things of the Spirit, to do it in spirit and in truth, and to know that the Holy Spirit, when you accept Jesus into your heart, lives and dwells inside of you and can prompt you and propel you to do things you never thought was imaginable on your own. And that is how good and gracious and loving God is to all of us. And so I want to thank you for tuning in and to listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button because our next conversation is going to be on the Holy Spirit, but is on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yeah. That was dramatic. Thanks for getting yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us.